um, the, yes, and I am recording this, from the COSAD uh, Development Corporation here. And she is going to primarily talk about childcare in COSAD, but part of our community chat is if you have any burning questions for her, she'll do her best to answer them. So welcome, Jen. Thank you. Um, so I know that um, Lori asked me if I was going to talk about economic development, and I always love to talk about economic development anytime. Um, but right now, the burning topic in my office is daycare. And um, it's been something that has been, I want to say an issue, but it's, it's been a problem for ever. So um, 25 years ago, I was on the daycare board over in Gothenburg, and we had the same problem that we see today. And that is um, our daycare providers um, at our community child care center, we're paying them like minimum wage. And we're expecting them to, to basically set the foundation for our youth as they enter into school. So most of those kids are with those daycare providers more than they're with their parents in a day. And yet we're not able to pay them what, what their actual value is worth. And you would think of a simple solution would be, all right, well, let's charge more for the services so that we can pay our providers more. But our families are already paying over 20% of their median income for daycare. And so that's not a viable solution either. And so, like I said, this has been a, a problem that has gone on forever is that we have a hard time getting staff and keeping staff because of the amount of work it is, um, the responsibility, and then we have a hard time um, keeping a center maintained and all of the stuff that goes into it. And because there's a lot of regulation out there, um, the number of families in health daycares have declined over, since 2010 in Nebraska, they've gone down by 20%. So that's huge. So we don't have that as another option like we did maybe in the past. And so um, I put together this little infographic because I like pictures and it's pretty low quality pictures. But um, right now, we at the uh, COSA Child Care, they're licensed for 70 kids and they have, or I think 65, don't quote me on that, please. Um, <laughs> but I think that they have about 40 that they can actually accommodate. So they have excess capacity that they could be tapping into, but they, they have a hard time getting the staff. Um, there's a waiting list of around 30 kids. Um, 12 to 30 babies. So um, you can just imagine how hard it is. I mean, if you're a mom that needs to go back to work and you, you're on a waiting list behind 12 other babies, you're probably not going to be going back to work anytime soon. I'm, I'm not going to lie. So um, we have much more demand than we have capacity for in our community. And so um, that is why right now it is an economic development issue because um, I started to get involved when I'm in the process of recruiting a business to town and I thought everything was going really great. Um, thought I had all the signatures on the bottom line and, and the main people that were going to own the business said, yeah, and we're going to need childcare and we can't find them childcare. And so all of a sudden, well, we don't know if we're going to be able to come to town. If we can't get childcare, then we, we can't move here um, because it's going to take both of us to run this business. So um, I was like, that's done it. When it affects my ability to recruit new business and industry to town, then, then it's an economic development issue. Um, I know that the hospital has tried to recruit professionals to town and has lost um, the ability to recruit some people because they couldn't find daycare. When Angela Simpson was the uh, superintendent here, her grandson, she was taking him to Gothenburg for daycare. So it doesn't look good when our, our school superintendent in COSAD has to go to the next town over for childcare. Um, another story is Amy Hainer, who works out at Camp Nigger, they live out there. 
um, she was able, to, she had one kid in daycare here, and she, but she had three, and she decided to go back to work um, full time. They couldn't take the other two, so she, she could get them in on their bath break. But she didn't want to lose her spot in code that just in case more spots came open. So she would leave her house in the morning, take two kids over to Gothenburg, then come over and take one child to COVID child care, and then go back to work. So it took her an hour and 15 minutes every morning to drop off her, her kids at daycare. Now, the reason we live in a small town is because it takes us five minutes to get anywhere. It shouldn't take you in COVID Nebraska an hour and 15 minutes to drop off your children at daycare. Um, and so I've had other people that have talked to me and said, yes, we are taking our kids to another town, either Kozad or Lexington for daycare, because there wasn't any um, openings here. And if they're still in daycare in that town, that's probably where we'll opt them into school, because um, that is where our other kids will be in daycare, and I want all my kids in one, one town. And I don't blame them. And so it is, it's a huge economic impact to not have the capacity in our community to accommodate the kids that we need to accommodate. And so um, right now, <clears throat> I had a study done by an economist at NCB, and they looked at it for Gotham County um, as a whole. But they said the cost of having inadequate child care for Gotham County families is 5.2 million. So that means there's that many people that are sitting out of the workforce that could be earning additional wages, but can't because they can't find childcare. So they could be going to work full time where they're working part time, or they've had to miss work because you know they, they don't have childcare for a um, certain amount of time. So that's a lot of disposable income within our county that that is out there to be had, um, but can't because. And I don't think that that's something that, that people look at. And then um, the other economic impact that was brought about in this study was that it's costing Gotham County employers about $2.6 million for employees not having adequate daycare. Because um, if you can imagine if you don't have enough slots for kids that need it, there's not enough slots. If, if your daycare provider is sick um, or can't be there one day, then you're probably going to have to take off work unless you have a relative or, or a close friend that's willing to step up for you. Um, you're probably going to have to miss work. And so I, I know of a teacher last year that um, gave her notice for teaching because she had daycare, but it wasn't reliable. And so she was missing out on so much time at work that it was it was stressful and she just decided I, I'm going to wait and go back to teaching after my kids are out of daycare. So um, it impacts our businesses, it impacts our families. And um, so we did a survey just here right after Christmas of parents to find out um, if they had any problems finding daycare or, or, or what the issues really are. And 82% of the families that responded said that they had um, a problem finding daycare. It was either extremely hard or somewhat difficult to find arrangements. Half of those that we surveyed said that they're happy with their daycare situation currently. The other half said it's always looking, it's, it's the only thing that they have. It's the only option available. Um, and so I kind of made a little graph about why childcare was hard to find. Um, the main reason is that people don't have the income. There's no space. And so it's not, I mean, there was a few that said it was because they couldn't afford it. Um, There's some that wasn't comfortable with the quality of care that was the only option out there. Um, there were quite a few people that said transportation is an issue. So if you um, have a child that has to go to school and you're taking them to a daycare, that somehow that kid has to get it from daycare to school. And if the daycare provider doesn't have the transportation arranged, sometimes that can be problematic. Um, and then we have people in this county that work different shifts. And so if you don't have, um, you know, our daycares are usually seven to six. Um, and that doesn't always line up with what people's hours are if you're a police officer or if you're a, uh, uh, what's 
to working as a nurse at the hospital. One thing that is interesting to note, I'm kind of a, a nerdy geek, but um, so in COSAD, our area median income is lower than the two medians on either side of us. And if you look at the number of people that are living below the poverty level, um, 75% of those living below the poverty level are single moms. And 94% of people that have to sit out of the workforce are single moms. And so a lot of, you know, you can hear people that have opinions. There's always a lot of people with a lot of opinions and they have, um, they're like, oh, nobody wants to work. Well, that might be the case. I mean, in a handful of instances, but in some, some realities is that they can't work because either they can't afford the daycare or they don't have the options for daycare. So, um, <clears throat> so they have to sit out of the workforce. And so um, my mission right now for um, COSAD is to just bring awareness to the situation that um, we have excellent daycare providers. It's not a knock on, on anybody that's doing daycare out there. It's just that they're overworked, underpaid, and we need, I hate to say, we need more people that are willing to step up and, um, and add capacity to our daycare. So I don't know what the answer is um, to that. One thing, I mean, I don't know, Nick, I'm gonna tell you our daycare providers at the through the childcare as a state requirement, they say that they have to have an employee fingerprinted. And right now it takes six weeks for them to get the results of those fingerprints back to be able to be cleared to work at the daycare. So if you think about somebody that's applying for a job and you can't even tell them if they're hired within six weeks, they're gonna go find another job tomorrow. Um, and so that's one of their issues in trying to get fully staffed. And I don't know if there's anything that could be done about that, if that's a policy issue at the state or if there's a way to get fingerprints back sooner or Yeah, I don't know much about the process. I, I would guess that fingerprinted becomes a state license probably for a daycare provider. So the state is probably doing the background checks. Um, as far as what that process is, we'll run that up probably to see if we can speed it up, minimize it, you know, bypass a couple things. I don't know. Okay. Um, do, do, you guys, do you guys have the capacity to do fingerprinting here? Yeah, and well, I, I say that the sheriff's office. We would go, yeah, they, okay. their capability there's about some county sheriff's office at the jail. Because um, I'm on the after zone board and they're licensed as a daycare provider for older kids and they have the same issue. And they have they they were told they had to go to North Platte. That's four days work now. Yeah. But they said they can't get the results back. Um, in a reasonable amount of time mm -hmm. to be able to um, <clears throat> basically get somebody to, yeah. to come to work. Yeah. Um, nobody's going to sit out. I mean, Ty Rose had her job in kind of held it back in six weeks. I don't know. Probably doesn't need to go on for that. Um, then I don't know. Um, you know, we, we've talked about adding additional capacity. The daycare has the ability to add more kids, but again, like I said, our, our daycare providers are usually getting paid below the poverty level, and usually the only benefit that they have um, is if maybe if they have their own kids, they can bring their own kids. So I don't know. I think that there has to be um, a public-private partnership our businesses are relying on people having affordable, adequate daycare so that their employees can come to work. And, and so maybe we need to speak out to our businesses a little bit more to see if there's anything they can do to help the situation. Um, I know that the, the Community Foundation and the, for the charitable fund um, are very good about giving to single child care. Um, but I don't know that you know, if a lot of the businesses are aware that they have difficulties in finding employees. And honestly, when the minimum wage goes up, um, the daycare is going to have to raise the rates. So that tells you what they're making. Um, so we need to 
Right, and then when it's per child, the more kids that you have, the more expensive, obviously, it is. But yeah, so like the average, um, I'll put this on here, the average cost of child care for families, and this was back in 2018, is $12,790. So I remember when my first child out, I was probably really excited when I was a kid, <laughs> you know. Um, and so we had people on the survey that said they held off on having kids because they um, knew that there weren't going to be child care options for them. And um, they weren't really sure what they were kids. Um, so and we had people that said that they've got kids in multiple districts because there's not space. So again, this is an economic development issue for our whole whole community. Um, we have to increase our capacity if we want to grow, if we want to attract healthcare professionals, teachers, new businesses, um, if we want to improve quality of life for people so that they aren't forced to sit out of um, the workforce. We've got a shortage of teachers, we've got a shortage of all of these different professionals, but yet they're sitting at home because they can't go to work. Um, that could be one way to solve some of our problems with the, the workforce crisis. So um, basically the reason I've been going to different nonprofit groups and asking them to pass a resolution, just kind of making them aware of the issues that are surrounding daycare in COVID. And um, one of the things that I've been telling people is that we're looking for innovative and sustainable ideas from the community that could help us to improve access and quality of care. And so I think the first thing is to just make sure that we have an informed and engaged community. So thank you, Lori, for setting um, meetings like this up. And then just we're in the business of listening. And so I'm not smart enough to know what the answers to this is. If I was, like I said, I sat on a executive board 25 years ago, I would have come up with something then when I had a better memory in mind. Um, but there's got to be some ideas out there. There's other communities that are, are um, working on solving this problem. And so I'm not afraid to steal other communities' ideas. Um, if anybody says, you know, this might be kind of crazy, um, throw it out there. Well, I have something kind of crazy for you. Good. I'm I was just actually on KRVN earlier today. I'm and I wrote, I'm writing down. <laughs> Um, I saw that they reported that Lexington Communities for Kids were selected for child care expansion mm -hmm. through ARPA funds. Mm -hmm. And it said that um, they were awarded $87,500 to increase 34 child care spots for zero to five age by June of this year. Mm -hmm. And that's all through um, a program called communitiesforkids.org. And that money is gone now. Yeah. And so, you know, I feel like we're a little behind um, where we should have been in our planning and discussions in order to get some of these ARPA funds. There's another grant. It came out Tuesday. No, it came out on Monday. Um, it's due on Tuesday of next week. And you have to increase capacity. So um, if I'm licensed for, like, because I'm child care, I'm licensed for 60 kids, but I only have the ability right now to do 40, you have to increase your license capability. Um, and it's only good for certain things. And you have to have the money spent by June. And you have to have your increased capacity, like, in place by December. And so, um, if we had started these conversations 12 months ago and we know exactly what we need in order to increase our capacity, we'd be in a little bit better um, situation.
situation to take advantage of those funds. But unfortunately, we started late. Um, and there was that, yeah, community for kids had other funds to increase capacity. And so kudos to Lexington um, for being a part of that. I know Gothenburg also is a part of community for kids. So I'm hoping that they might, might have gotten some of that money too for their impact center. Gothenburg is building a um, impact center where they'll be able to take all of their in-home daycares, like I think, I don't know about 100%, but most of their in-home daycares are all gonna be under one roof. Um, there'll be a gymnasium in there, which the school will use. They'll have a community center in there, which I think they'll rent out. Um, so they're putting some multiple uses under um, one roof, but Big Bend Preschool will be part of that. Um, and honestly, don't put this in the paper. You don't wanna hear <laughs> Shut up the camera. Yeah. Um, I really think that we, as in COSA, need to work hard on solving our problem before Gothenburg gets that center because we will, they'll take our kids. Mm -hmm. And if they take our kids in daycare, they'll take them in school. So how did they do that, Jen? I mean, is it, was it a private fundraising issue? Just Lori, they've, been, they've been talking about this and working on this plan for what they were going to do since when I was at so it's been, they've been working on this for five or six years. Mm -hmm. um, well, I know they have because the libraries, their community needs survey is all focused around yeah. daycare. So like I said, we're, we're just a little behind. That's why it's, um, it's not just important because there's funds out there. I mean, our government's writing checks to everybody right now. Um, so, so is this something that has a has a like a steering committee been formed or anything we've, here in COSA? We've kind of got an ad hoc committee. We've got some members of um, the COSA child care board of directors. Um, Robert Dyer from the hospital. Of course, there was the workforce issue for for them. Um, Bill Wilson's son. He's on the COSA Development Corporation board. Um, so he's on it. Um, Casey Madsen, who owns um, a daycare in Gothenburg and Lexington, she's been on it. Claire Bazada, we've invited her um, to be part of the discussion um, because she's been on a statewide advisory committee. Um, so those are primarily the ones that we've talked to. Um, Scott Foster with Dolphin Area Development, he's the one that helped us with the survey. And we got, oh, James Ford is also, the school superintendent, he's also on our principal chair committee. And so um, basically what right now, I, like I said, I don't have a solution. Mm -hmm. um, we're going out and we're just making the community aware of the issues and hoping that we can create some, some ideas. Um, if somebody's interested in like starting a home daycare, do you have resources? I don't, <laughs> I don't, um, not for home daycares. Um, but I think that the state does right now. Um, so, I mean, there's this capacity building grant that they could apply for on Tuesday um, and that'll help them get started. Um, but I think that the state does have some small grants for, for in-home daycares that they want to get started. Um, but I can certainly sit down with them and help steer them into, you know, to some people that are smart that know how to go about this. I, I mean, I have no control. <laughs> so, um, I don't even have kids in daycare anymore. So, um, I'm a little out of touch with all of that. So, but. Do you think, um, do you think the issue is more if we, if this, the community could find a way to pay people more, then more people would apply. I realize there's a streamlining issue going on. Yeah, I, I do believe that if, if we could offer more, um, some wages, then it would be a more attractive job. And if 
local child care centers um, would be able to attract more workers and that would enable them because there's ratios that they have right. to meet so you can only have like i don't even think know what they are but maybe one worker that leaves for the summer and 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 then they also fill in age like mm -hmm. they have to be a certain they can't be under a certain age or blah 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 so um there's all those requirements but that would certainly help to be able to add to it um but what they told me right now is it's not a matter of square footage it's a matter of staff so yes i think if it was um we could streamline the process so we could get new people and it seems to in a little bit more then i think that that would definitely help with our staffing issues um i think that some of the in-home regulations from the state have become onerous to the point where people are just like i'm not moving from here yeah. like you're not going to come in and tell me my own home this and that and whatever and so we had a lot of people walk away from it and they're like years and and the primary reason that they say that they walked away is because they were being over regulated now that being said i don't know what the answer to that is because it's we're we're dealing with the you know the lives of our our children and we hear horror stories every day so i don't know what that that balance is and i don't know what exactly all those regulations are but i think it's it's something too that we need to have policy makers about like how do we how do we make this so that we have quality people offering quality care and we're not over regulating them to the point where it's not feasible for them to operate. Like I said, I don't know what the answer mm -hmm. to that is, but I mean, we, we see that in lots of different industries um, and policy go to um, like sometimes go to church groups that are doing what they're supposed to be doing. Do you know what the next steps for the ad hoc committee are going to be? Yes. So um, I think that we will be writing some letters of support to um, some individuals um, that are wanting to start a community daycare. And we took advantage of this capacity building money that's out there. Um, so I know that the Methodist Church reached out to me today and asked for a letter of support because they're going to um, add capacity at the North Methodist Church. And then I have another gal that is interested in maybe giving us a community center. And so we will work with them on trying to find them funding or the support that they need to get established. Um, so that'll be kind of our next our next step is to work with the willing mm -hmm. and um, making sure that they have the resources and tools to, to successfully get going. Um, we're going to continue to just go out there and pound the table and tell people um, about this because I know the net from different ideas surface and we talked about um, community businesses could guarantee certain number of slots so that it takes a little bit out of the risk out of it for daycare centers to add staff. Um, I mean, right now we've got 30 kids on a waiting list, so there's not any risk for, um, they have to keep their workers like current. Mm -hmm. um, but I think that, again, just creating an engaged and aware public is, is what we're trying to do right now. Um, so bringing up any ideas that do you at the CDC do you offer any type of loans like if somebody wanted to start we could do a loan yes um, we can use our um, sales tax recommended development um, to do a loan and for child care and all the activities um, we also have other loan funds that are held with the city um, that the, the rates are comparable to the we can definitely help in that area. I just know, like the home daycares, they have to have a fenced yard and different things. I do things. think the Department of Health and Human Services helps with fences. Yeah. Like, that's a safety issue. 
So I think that they have don't have any money. Um, but I think that they have grants to help with those issues. So if it's like fire smoking out and, and fencing or is that right? Or like locks on doors and those kind of things. Um, I think that they have some some formula for that. Um, so but yeah, we'll we'll definitely sit down and, and if they know what their needs are, um, we'll help them develop a plan so that we can and you said um, charitable fund of Cozad, and did I hear you say Cozad Community Foundation contribute? I think that they have, think that they have um, donated in the past to, to help out there. I know already. And do those funds? Do you know? Do they help toward um, wages, or do they have to go well, for something? Well, I kind of um, where I wish, but we're looking at an aging building over there. It's pretty much out of care building. Not here, um, and so you know, I think that one time somebody told me, Well, our goal is to raise money each year so that we can replace one window each year. And I thought, Oh, no, I like that. Now, we wouldn't expect our teachers at the school to go out and raise money to improve the envelope of the school building, mm -hmm. and we shouldn't expect the families and the staff at the daycare center to do the same. I know that they battle with you know, um, hot water heaters and HVAC and roof and windows and they've got all of those things. And so I feel like when they get those donations, they have to raise those um, to affect the upkeep of an older building. Um, I know, I think it was I've been feeling hot as we have all these feelings, but uh, I believe it was Amber Garrett said um, when she was on the daycare board or an assistant there, they had a drainage issue. And she goes, I remember going out there and pulling up all the sod and doing the, the dirt out there so that the, the drainage would be proper and laying all the sod down. You know, those were things. <laughs> I mean, that. That's a lot to expect from a daycare board member or parent. Um, I mean, I, I don't know if I asked my board if they would go sign and they would do that, let alone a mom, you know? So, um, no, I think normally when they get those kind of requests um, or when they get those donations, it usually goes towards the preservation of things. Um, I know, bless her heart, Tina Thurn over at Generation Center, and she does such an excellent job. She said if she gets excess food donations, that a lot of times she'll call the daycare and see if they need some extra stuff um, just to try to help out that way. So it, it's not a money making deal. Um, we are asking that it be asked of us kids um, and, and care about. What you're doing for that family and, and want to make a difference because you're not doing it for the pay. I guarantee you that. Mm -hmm. um, and it's not easy. You're not just sitting. You know, I love, I love rocking my grandbaby. He's one of the love of my life right now. But when he has his dirty diaper or when he starts crying, he's going right back to his mama. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so um, it, it's not just playing with kids all day. It takes hard work. Um, but it would be cool if there was a way that we could create a fund so that we could offer those those workers a bonus every year or something. I don't know. I mean, that would be a good idea. Mm -hmm. but I like it. <laughs> <laughs> what would you like us to take from today's community chat and help spread the word, I guess? Um, I think that just bringing this up. So I'm always a little defensive um, because people think economic development, I should just be out there recruiting the next Monroe Center or Country Town. And they, they don't realize that there's all these other little factors that go into it that if we don't have housing for the workers, we don't have any working people running 
our unemployment rate is 1% of the low. So it's not a lot of people out there that are just sitting around looking for jobs for the next 10% to come in. Um, and if realistically, we probably would be robbing Peter for employers um, for Paul. So um, we have to continually grow our community and it's a three-legged stool. So the businesses, um, you know, we can't have more businesses than what our housing and allow families, you know, and our families can't work unless they have the community amenities like daycare, health care, libraries, all of those things um, that families expect because it's a competition. Everybody has a choice of where they want to live anymore. And so we have to have a unique proposition and it can't just be a we're a small town where everybody knows everybody. Um, every, that's 95% of the problem. <laughs> so um, we have to do it better and we have to have the basis for them to be successful here. And then we have to create little things like music memories or um, you know, you know, the art project or the fun things that you do at the library. All of those things add to the quality of life and they're the, the icing on the cake. But if we don't have all the ingredients for that cake, um, you got nothing. And so I think, A, just getting the word out and that's why economic development is important to us right now is why we're doing it. Because the first thing is people say, well, why is she doing this? Why, is she, why isn't she out there uh, recruiting business? Well, I mean, I, I hear it. I would, hear, I would get the, the person that comes to me and says, you know, somebody said that and I just defended you and told them this. <laughs> da, da, da. I'm like, oh, thank you for telling me somebody just told me that. But um, so that's number one. It, it's an economic development issue right now. Um, number two, we need to find a way to um, support our existing daycare. We cannot let them go away. Our home, home based daycare providers make sure that they, are, they have the support um, and staff. You know, so so we have to maintain every daycare provider that we have. That we, we can't lose any of that in addition to the new capacity. So um, whether it's finding a, a fund that we can give those people some bonuses or hiring on employment until they get their six weeks of finger printing done, something. Um, and I don't know if you work with a place that, that does that or you know, you're part of a community group, the CEO or, or the foundation or, or what, if you just keep them in your prayers and in your mind that they're always in need, always. Um, and then the other part is helping to build new capacity. So whether it's the Methodist Church or whether Dallas and us are starting to do that, um, just helping them out in terms of getting them established in, in the community so that we can keep building more capacity. Mm -hmm. I guarantee you, um, even probably with those two in the pipeline, we might still not be meeting our you know. Well, I'm looking, you know, 10 years down the line, two of the people I know who do home daycare are probably going to be retiring. So what, what can we do to help bring somebody into the fold? That was the issue brought up with Lex. So there's a lot of new home gals are getting to the age where they're wanting to step down, but like that happens and you lose capacity. And, you know, Lex is sitting there with like 700 kids probably without child care if it, the need came up. So that's what I always tell kids. Yeah. You know, six to seven hundred. So, um, yeah, I don't know. I mean, I think it's something we can talk to our kids like keep them next to us too about you know, like if you wanted to be a stay-at-home mom and you were just you know thinking about early childhood education or, or daycare as a maybe the entrepreneur the entrepreneur class or something yeah mm -hmm. um, it's not one of those careers that you think well hey why don't you go up and be a daycare provider um, but there are benefits I mean if you're in home daycare you know you have to my my daughter has um, a nanny in Denver, and Denver is nice. Um, the nanny guy lost my husband just wanted to send my date down the hospital at the end of the day. <laughs> um, but he left, so <laughs> that. But uh, yeah, I mean, I, I think it's it's something that we can do. Just creating that dialogue, I think, is very important because most people 
you know, because I tell them this is an excellent condition. I love for that. I'm not from here. Um, and, but what I've seen is when you present the community with a problem, people step up to solve it. And so I think that's what we're doing here is we are letting them know that this is a problem. And you know, to get it out and more ideas can come to the table. Does anybody have questions? I've been shouting out questions as I come and thanks for letting me know about the, the KRVN thing. I just saw that and I was like, wow, if yeah. any of that money's available, mm -hmm. that would be great. Yeah. I mean, unfortunately, if we would have maybe started this a while back, then we would have maybe journeyed more in line to um, receive those funds. I reached out to the um, community speakers, and they even have a waiting list as a community to have them work with you <laughs> to find solutions. So it's a Nebraska because issue. It's, it's, it's a huge issue for Nebraska. I've been reporting on the Lex issue since. Difficult one to solve because, like, if you can't, you know, have capacity, if you can't have the staff for it, it's just a vicious cycle that it's like it's hard to find a way to break into that. And so, it's it's a tough one. It's going to take some innovative solutions to find out. And, like I said, it's not just us from Dawson County, it's everybody's got Does Lexington, does their YMCA have a daycare? Mm -hmm. Or is that just you? I think that's something that they were looking into, but again, it's um, insurance and liabilities mm -hmm. and all. So it's like really tough for anybody who wants to break into it new. If you can bring in an existing daycare, like the Methodist Church did in Lexington, like Casey Madison brought that in as like that help because the church had the space, but like trying to ask a church to go through the onerous process of getting licensed, most you know people like were going to have to pass that. So yeah, it's 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 an issue and not one of these solutions. I will say for. For COSAD, um, just imagine what the dialogue would be like if we didn't have after one program. Mm -hmm. Because I don't know how, I, so um, Carmen told me how many kids. I mean, What's well, over 100 I think daily? Probably like 120 kids mm -hmm. even averaged, like all the kids that go to after school. Um, and in the summer, it's an even summer, larger program, and, so and that's actually that. that's actually solving a little bit of a problem because incoming kindergartners can use that summer program. Yeah. So, yeah, I don't even know. Yeah, or the school's We'd preschool program. A bigger world of hurt if we didn't have that after school program, mm -hmm. and I know that that's something that I don't think that other communities have. Um, so. But we're a community that solves problems. And um, there were some people back in the day, I guess, that, that had the, I don't know, passion to create that program. And um, it's been around for us, or it's been around for a while. So that's a good thing. Would you be willing to take questions about things other than? Yeah, oh yeah, absolutely. <laughs> um, I'll take, yeah, we don't have to just take, talk about daycare. I don't know. Um, we're uh, at the Development Corporation. We're building houses in the northeast part of town. I'll take questions about why or what we're doing up there. Um, we just bought the Tenneco site. Um, we've come a million miles in two years in terms of where we're at with that. Um, I'll have questions about that. Um, downtown businesses, programs that we have here. Are you doing, um, I was gonna say, are you doing another round of uh, business improvement? The downtown revitalization grant. Yes, thank you. Grant, um, that's on our uh, agenda for this year is to apply for probably we'll have September is when those applications are and then after we get it boarded it's visible to a big board we have to do it um so it's probably like a two-year thing before we would actually be able to give the funding a grant to do some facade improvements or energy upgrades handicapped accessibility or uh, eligible activities under that um so 
Yes, would love to do that. There are some USDA grants right now because of all the ARPA money. Um, USDA had a program where for business they would do 25% of an improvement for energy upgrades so like windows, HVAC, um, insulation. Uh, and they've upped that to 40% right now. So if there's any businesses out there that have needs like that, um, come, come talk to me um, because that can significantly help offset some of those costs and some of the savings that you get from doing those energy improvements and help pay for your portion of the upgrades. So going back to daycare, would they be eligible for any of those? For profit. It's the energy USDA program is for profit. So or not all of them, but that specific one. Okay. Yes, we would yeah, they'll they'll give it to a farmer to upgrade their um, you know, motor on their irrigation well, but they won't give it to the school or the daycare <laughs> to improve um, energy efficiency there. So um so yeah Right now, because of all the ARPA money, um, I'm administering grants <clears throat> that are, it, I mean, it's time consuming, but it is a need in our community to um, do a lot of grants for the Young Generation Center, that free library permit. Um, we have the parish hall because that was the site of the vaccination during the pandemic, and, and it was not very living there. And then the, air conditioning wasn't working and the ceiling fan spun off the ceiling and crashed. Um, they didn't have enough uh, outlets to have the refrigeration of the vaccines. I mean, so it's not a very good designated Red Cross Center if it's not meeting our needs. And so we're looking for an upgrade so that we can better handle the situation from you know, pandemic. Um, and I'm doing So I do work, I mean, I, it's not just working with our businesses, I do work with our local nonprofits um, to help them and I'm trying to think. I'm, I'm it's me and half-time Robin. <laughs> so um, we, we try to do, we try to get out there and help the whole community and just help the um, center as a new one. And I know I called you a while back and we talked about that and you're talking about that cruise, but I just didn't know if there's any major updates with that or if you guys are still kind of in that mode. Yeah, so um, we are in that mode. Um, we're in conversations with a couple of industries right now. Um, having control of the site has been huge um, because it takes out you know, that unknown about like, what are they going to charge us for the site or, you know. Um, but the major breakthrough has come just within the last few months that um, Tenneco and the state, which is Nebraska Department of Environment and Energy, have come to an agreement on how the site would be remediated and how the redevelopment plan will go. And so in the past, it's been really hard to try to recruit somebody and they say, all right, well, who's responsible for the cleanup? Well, we all know that Tenneco is responsible for the cleanup, but Tenneco had a restrictive covenant on the property that said, you can't touch the dirt because they didn't want us to find anything. Otherwise, be responsible. Oh, yeah, they'd be responsible. <laughs> so, um, so we've come a long way with them in terms of now we have permission to disturb the dirt. And if we find something, we know what happens next. We have like a little flow chart that you say if it's this, if it's that, or whatever. Um, and that's been, honest to goodness, I'm not going to lie, it's like 30 years in the making um, that the state and Tenneco have been at odds at how the site can get cleaned up. And so my board made it a priority for us um, last year that, I mean, and that was basically every day of my life was talking on the phone about that Tenneco site. I was 
not funny. It's funny. And um, we had, we finally had a meeting where we got Tenneco's attorney and we reached out, myself, um, the Department of, of Economic Development, all sat down in a room just like this. It was the first time that that had ever happened. And we all realized that there was a lot of distrust. And so the five that it read, they said it screamed. Um, and there was no, nothing in between. Not this and thing. so I hired a consultant to clean up basically what she does is um, redevelopment of, of brownfield sites. And so by having her in the room and it read and it screamed, she could say, or we could do this and this would be a viable solution and then everybody would just be here. And so um, we have A, control of the site, B, permission to redevelop it, C, we know who's responsible if we find anything during that redevelopment. So now it's on me to um, find somebody that would fit there. Um, and have daycare. <laughs> yeah, but you, you, again, they're going to say, um, I have 100 employees. Where are my employees' kids going to go? If I'm bringing people here, where are they going to live? Um, so, it, like I said, it's that three legged stool, and you can use it in a lot of focus. Um, so, yes, we are, in, we are in talks with different people, and some of those things, you know, they take two to three years to. I would say the courtship, you know, you don't, you don't marry the first one <laughs> day. <laughs> uh, you have to go home from the dance with the first person you dance with. So um, we have to be a right fit and they have to be a right fit for us because um, whatever happens out there is probably going to be another you know, 60 year relationship as far as contract. So economically, what would your vision be for daycare in Cozad to help you recruit the businesses you, you want to that Cozad wants? Economically, mm -hmm. you mean? Um, it's like if I had a half a million dollars, I'd yep. dump it into building one more daycare that could double our existing capacity. So one more community daycare? I would say at least a couple more smaller in-home options and another um, so there's the, the um, at home daycares or the, the Methodist Church where um, they have a million small options, but then another center, I think is what we need. I think we probably need to increase the capacity by about 100 employees. So be able to staff them at a, at a good wage, yeah. not just minimum right. wage. That would be your goal. I would say yes. Yeah. Now we have to figure out how to make that happen <laughs> without raising the price, the cost for families to out outpace what they can make mm -hmm. the price is. So there, there is that. Um, you know, our daycare providers are making half of what the payment is used, right now. and obviously they don't have the most generally, they don't have a full year to do still. Um, they're, they're providing that foundation. So um, I'm not saying pay them a premium position or anything else with that, but I'm saying they should make more than a, the, the person behind the counter runs it making. Because they're still training. They have, I mean, they have to go through a background check. They have to have CPR certification. Um, I'm trusting them with your child. Or you hope they. I don't know, but yeah, somebody, um, I think a building, I mean, for daycare, if we had another center, where are we going to put them? Are we going to build something new? That's super expensive. Um, where do we put them? Mm -hmm. They can't be too big, they can't be too small. It's too big, we can't afford to make room. Like everybody says, oh, the administrative office is up there at the school center, and that's too big. It's not realistic. Um, so then, 
Yeah, and then, I mean, you, you can say those things, but the administrative building has its own physical issues with roof and windows and things like that. Yeah, and even if you looked at north, they still have roofing issues. Not right. 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 Yeah. 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 And really, any building that's available would probably yeah, have some. Yeah, I think I think Mother Baker, so it can't be on the street, but you also have to have access to schools. Um, you also have the ability to have some outdoor areas you can do because of the idea. Um, you know, you have a lot of traffic, so it's not even really residential neighborhood because you don't have people coming there. And so, um, you know, you have to idea where the spot, ideal spot would be to do what you're talking about. Um, but that would be something to think about. I mean, um, and if you can think of any existing structure to show you what that. Well, it is almost one o'clock. That time went really fast. Um, I'd like to thank you all for coming again. Does anybody have any 